So you all know who, know who Dwayne Johnson is, The Rock, right? Look at your bulletin in case you don't. If, do you, everyone here recognize who's on the front of the bulletin? Anyone not recognize him? Excellent. Okay, make sure we're all on the same page. I'd like you to imagine him standing in a circle with five or six other bodybuilders having very serious discussions about whatever it is that bodybuilders discuss. Not being one myself, I have no clue what that would be. But uh, let's say someone uh, walks up to this group of five or six, someone who very obviously is not a bodybuilder, someone who is very obviously not in great health and is not spending any time in a gym at all. And that person walks up to the group and, and you know that sort of nervous waiting when someone wants to say something, wants to say something, wants to say something, right? waiting, and the guy kind of jumps in awkwardly and interrupts. And he asks Mr. Rock, Mr. What do you call him? Mr. Johnson? Right? I want to be just like you. I want to be ripped and, and buff and, and, and just in amazing shape. What do I need to do? And Mr. Johnson, uh, being patient and gracious, gives him the answer. It all starts with diet and exercise, so hire a personal trainer and start with that. And the guy interrupts and says, yeah, 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 I know that, I got that, I have someone hired, but what do I need to do to look like you? And Okay, Mr. Johnson now a little bit more annoyed, he gives him the answer, if you want to look like me, here's what you do. You get up at three in the morning, six days a week. You work out for two and a half hours, you've got to burn three and a half thousand calories in that workout. And then, you've got to eat seven meals a day, and that's got to include 2.3 pounds of cod. It's a lot of cod. That's a lot of fish, right? Never eat candy again. The last time Dwayne Johnson ate candy was a package of Twizzlers back in 1987, right? You never eat candy again. And then you've got to do this workout and eat like this. You've got to eat like this every day. You've got to, there's 5,000 calories of eat food in one go. And you've got to spend two and a half hours a day eating to eat these seven meals. Then you've got to cook it all, right? And, and then you've got to do this six days a week. And after you work out, then you've got to do your day. Because he works out like that, and then he goes and does whatever The Rock does during the day, shooting a movie or whatever he does, right? And so <coughs> this guy uh, who is interrupted, he hears what is being required, and he, and he turns and he walks away sad because he's not even sure what type of fit, that cod was even a fish, right? Uh, and this, what's the guy looking for in our imaginary little moment? He's looking for the quick answer, the shortcut, the simple answer, right? This is, it's not a new thing for us to want a maximal amount of result from a minimal amount of input. To be educated without study, to be wise without experience, to be fit without self-control. We have a very similar moment that happens in the Gospel according to Matthew. It's an unexpected moment, and it, it kind of breaks from how things have been going. And to understand this moment, we've got to back up a bit and get some context. What has been happening is, is that Jesus has turned to Jerusalem and said, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be crucified there. And if you're going to follow me, you're going to take up your cross as well. And the disciples are struggling with this because Peter says, no, no, not you, Lord. And Jesus looks at him and says, get thee behind me, Satan. And this is hard discussions, right? They, they, they're heading towards Jerusalem, and it's got to the point where every discussion has a lot of weight on it. Like, this is the point at, at which Thomas says, if we're going to go to Jerusalem, let's go to Jerusalem so that we might die with him. This is the point where uh, the religious authorities are quizzing him and trying to lay traps, verbal traps, that, and that have a lot of uh, te their tense interactions. This is the, about the time when the religious authorities say, ask, should, I pay, should, should we be paying taxes? And if he says, yes, we should pay taxes, then, then the Jewish people will revolt against him. And if he says, no, we should not pay taxes, then they can sick the Roman legions on him to have him uh, uh, arrested and, and executed for trying to foment uh, rebellion. So this is a moment when things are getting very, very tense. The disciples have been following Jesus for three years, and it's getting real now. It's getting, a lot of pressure is coming. And so in the middle of this like, tense moment, this guy waltz up, and he asks Jesus a question. Teacher, what must I do to obtain eternal life? What must I do to obtain eternal life? 
And Jesus stops, and he's like getting the disciples ready to go into Jerusalem. And for him to stop what he's doing to listen to this fellow is impressive. Right? So he stops and he answers the question. But first you've got to look at the question. The question is, it tells you a little bit about the guy, because it's a kind of a, bit, a question that's off base. Jesus' message thus far has been, the, G the kingdom of God has come near. Receive what, what God is offering. It's all about been accepting, follow me, and then receive what I am offering. All right, so Jesus' message is about been accepting and receiving and following. And, and the verb that this guy uses is obtain, get. Right? It's kind of grabby. It's kind of, it makes me think of my, my toddler when he starts asking for something and I have to remind him, do you want some milk, please? Right? This guy has come up and he, how do I get this? How do I obtain it? How do I buy it? When do I know I've got it? Where's my receipt for purchase? So the question is a little bit off base. It's a little unhealthy to begin with. But Jesus gives him an answer. Jesus gives the answer. Jesus gives the answer he needs. Start with the Ten Commandments. Start with the commandments, right? Start with the commandments. And the guy says, well, what, what commandments? Give me, come on, tell me what I need to do. Give me the commandments. Well, don't steal. Don't lie. Take care of your parents. Right? Take care of your neighbor. And, and the guy interrupts and says, you know, and there's this tone of voice that you can hear as you're sort of imagining how this unfolds. And, and the guy interrupts and says, you know, I, I did that. Am I good? Right? I've done all those things. Am I good? Can I move on? I have appointments this afternoon. I've got things I've got to do. Can I check this off my list? Talk to Rabbi, have eternal life? Right? Is there anything else I need to add to my to-do list? Can I write this off? When the young fellow cuts Jesus off, what he's cutting Jesus off from is this invitation not to a get-rich-quick type scheme, not a quick answer, not a simple thing, but he's cu cutting off Jesus' invitation to a way of life. All right, go, let's go back to our sort of imaginary moment with the rock. If, let's say you take the rock's imaginary advice. Let's say you hire a personal trainer and you're somewhat middle-aged, younger, middle-aged, right? And you're in decent enough health, and you can start doing what, what a personal trainer will tell you to do, what would happen? First, you'd start eating a bit differently, and you'd start working out Monday, Wednesday, Friday for an hour at a time. What happens after that? You do that for a few months. What happens next? Well, maybe you start eating a little bit more meat, a little bit more, more protein, and maybe you up it to an hour and a half or two hours Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then you keep on doing it, and a couple years after that, you come back, and maybe you're working Monday. Th you're working out Monday through Thursday for two hours, and you see how what would happen, right? If you you hire a personal trainer and you s accept that invitation, you start that as a way of life. You don't go straight from I want to look like you to eating 2.3 pounds of cod a day. You go from I want to look like you to hiring a personal trainer, and then you check in every six months, and you start you start this journey. And maybe down the road, you get to the point where you're working out, burning 3,500 calories in two hours. But remember, The Rock, he's 42. I don't think I know of any other person who's 42 who looks like that, right? He's 42. It has taken him decades to get to that point. You're not going to follow him and get there immediately. It takes a while. It's a journey. It's a process. You're gonna, it's going to take a bit, right? What, what Jesus is doing is the same type of logic. It's an invitation to a way of life. The guy wants to know, what do I need to do to live the life God wants me to live? And the response is, you start at the very, very beginning, a very good place to start. You start with the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are back there. That's at the start. That's when you have a bunch of Hebrew, ethnically Hebrew people who have just gotten out of slavery, and they don't know much except that there's a God who loves them, and they're heading somewhere good. Okay, here are the Ten Commandments, here's where you start. And then they take this jaunt through the wilderness, and as they go through the wilderness, they are taught more and more and more, as they experience more and more and more. And so over time, this becomes a people who then understand they have a king, and they understand the call of the prophets, they understand that there is a Messiah coming. But if you want to have the life that God wants to give you, you start at the very beginning, and then you follow sort of the Jewish people, and you under it took them a while to understand, it's going to take us a while to understand as well. It's going to be a journey. It's an invitation to a way of life. 
This is the same approach that Jesus took with the disciples. Right? Jesus doesn't go up to Thomas and say, Thomas, we're going to charge Jerusalem right now. We're going to confront the Ro Roman legions. We're going to confront the Sanhedrin or the religious authority. We're going to charge into this and I'm going to die. You want to come with me? Right? That, that's not the invitation Jesus gives at the beginning of the Gospels. What's the invitation that Jesus gives? Two words, right? Follow me. And then three years later, they're prepared to do that. But it's a journey. It takes time. You don't go from, my name's Jesus, let's charge Jerusalem, in the same way you don't go from, my name's Andy, I want to be buffed, to eating 2.3 pounds of cod a day. I don't think I eat 2.3 pounds of anything in a day. That's a lot of food, right? It just doesn't happen. The person who asks the question, what must I do to have eternal life, he is cutting himself off from this invitation to this journey. And so he asks, like, no, what do I really need to do? Where am I going? What, what's the point? What, what must I do? And so Jesus gives it to him. Okay, you want to know where you'll, you'll, where you'll end up if you follow me? Here's where you might end up. Write a check for everything you own, give it all away, and then seriously, follow me. He wants the quick answer, Jesus gives him the quick answer. He doesn't do it. He walks away. No surprise. I would too. The disciples are aghast. They have to be reassured. That's, this is not what I'm telling you to do. Right? Remember, I said follow me, and then we've been doing this for three years. No, I'm not asking you to do this. If you you're taking this journey with me, and with God, all things are possible. But that is the response Jesus gives him. You want the short answer? Fine. I'll give you the short answer. Write a check. Go for it. Right? I hear this as a challenging story, uh, and I was never I, it's one of those passages I was fairly certain I was never going to preach on until here I am. But I hear it as a, both a, a warning, excuse me, a warning and a, and a bit of grace. It's a warning and a reminder that there are no quick fixes, right? Do you all know of any quick fix that actually ever holds, that works? That's a legitimate question. Do you all ever know of a quick fix that ever truly is just a quick fix and it's done? There, what's that? Super glue. That's close. That and J.B. Weld. If I had to pick a quick fix that actually would hold, I'd give those two credit. That's as close as you get. But <laughs> super glue doesn't fix everything. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> Jesus was the perfect teacher, and he had a small group of people to work with, and it still took him, it still took him three years to get him ready. Right? It takes time. It takes time. There's no such thing as a quick fix. Instead, we are offered an invitation to follow Jesus daily. Follow Jesus today, and tomorrow will work out what that means. And, and I believe that to be the good news. It's the good news that I need to hear. I really need to hear that. You, the Kuhn family has a motto. Here's the Kuhn family motto. See a problem, solve a problem. I just got my business cards, and I put that front and center on the business card. And if you have a family motto, you might as well have it in Latin. If you're being pretentious, you might as well be really whole hog pretentious, right? Videre problema, solvere problema. That is the Kuhn way. You find the biggest problem, and you run towards it. That's what we do. There are certain things you can't solve like that, can you? There are certain problems that I cannot solve today. There are certain problems that it will take me day by day by day for the rest of my life. Following Christ is one of those things. I can't do it all today. I can follow Jesus today, and tomorrow I'll follow Jesus then. I don't have eternal life. It's not a possession I can put on my shelf. I receive eternal life as a gift of following Christ today, and tomorrow I'll pray a bit more, and here we'll go, we'll go again tomorrow. It would be crazy for, it would be just as crazy for, for me to start trying to eat 2.3 pounds of cod a day as it would be for me to write a check for everything I own and give it away. And maybe it will come to the point in my life and my discipleship following Jesus that I will do something that crazy, but I got to get there and I'm not there yet. My wife would kill me. <laughs> but we'd have to get there together. Right? We'd have to get there together. Next time I preach, it won't be next Sunday, that'll be UMW Sunday, but the Sunday after that, we're going to be talking about the state of the church. Where are we? Where are we going? We'll be talking about uh, the, some of the key verses out of Matthew. Uh, As you've done unto the least of these, you've done unto me. 
right? Uh, we'll be talking about the Great Commission, go forth, baptizing people in my name, all the nations. We'll be talking about the great, greatest commandments, love the Lord your God, and love your neighbor as yourself. And how do these things come together to shape where we're going as a church? And to have a sense of that goal is important. To have a sense of here's where we're going, this is what we're called to be, that's essential. But we can't have that conversation until we all are aware that we're not going to get there tomorrow. We're going to get there one step at a time. The invitation that Christ offers to us, what we are to receive, is not that we're going to be made perfect today. It's that we will follow Jesus today and we'll trust him to offer us our daily bread tomorrow. We're not in this to get perfect today. We're in this as a journey. And thanks be to God, it is a journey being led by someone we can trust. Amen.